James Day, public television pioneer and chairman of the CUNY TV Advisory Board, passed away in April 2008. His legacy includes the series Day at Night, which aired for 130 episodes beginning in 1973. The program features interviews with many of the great thinkers and achievers of the 20th century. These 30-year-old programs have been restored. The interviews remain fresh and relevant today, exploring issues that are still important to society. Showing them again is CUNY TV's tribute to Jim and his contributions to public television. Agnes DeMille is one of the great American women of the dance and the theater. It was she who turned the prim ballet of the concert stage into the rip-roaring, knee-slapping ballet of such hit Broadway shows as Oklahoma, Carousel, and Brigadoon, bringing dance to a wider audience than it had ever enjoyed. But despite the fact she was born into a certain amount of fame, Henry George the Great Single Taxer was her grandfather, and the equally famous Cecil B. DeMille was her uncle, she had to struggle against formidable odds to achieve her own fame, now assured. The years of struggle are recorded in the eight books she has written, the most recent of which is entitled, Speak to Me, Dance With Me. Mr. Mill, one critic has commented about your work by saying it was full of fire, even funny, and entirely free of swans. You don't recall that, perhaps? No, it is free of swans, though, that I can guarantee. Why? Yes, indeed it is, because you have made that transition from classical ballet to a ballet, to a kind of ballet which is, well, more indigenous to this country and more representative of the spirit of America. Why is it necessary to, to make that transition? Why did I feel it was yes, necessary yes. for me to make it? Right. Well, because I couldn't do swans. <laughs> They'd been done very nicely by mm -hmm. my betters, my mm -hmm. elders and my betters. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought it was high time that somebody did something else. And I personally had to do what I can do. I like swans. Mm -hmm. And um, I like the, the pure classic ballets. I like the abstract ballets. Mm -hmm. I would very much like to do ballets like George Balanchine. I can't. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. So that, that turns you to ballets which were which drew upon the American experience. Well, it turned, no, not immediately, mm -hmm. although the first solo dance I ever did was this thing called 49, and it was just the hold down and the breakdown and time steps and things mm -hmm. in a sunbonnet, and I had a certain quality, and John Martin, who was then the critic of the New York Times, said, I don't know whether to laugh or cry, but it makes me choke up, because it reminds me of things that happened before I was born. Mm -hmm. And so that was nice. Oh, and the best criticism I ever had was from Jacob Javits, who saw me do this. And he said, when you cross the stage and do this, he said, I know why I'm an American. Really? You've done a great deal, and even more recently, with your Heritage Theater in North yes. Carolina in drawing upon the, the, the folk music, the legends of America. Everything. As a, everything. Yes. Well, now, the thing is that we're the only country in the world that doesn't have a heritage theater, an, an indigenous folk theater. Mm -hmm. The only country. Ghana has three. Mexico has four. Mm -hmm. the, the Philippine Islands have three or four. We don't have anything. And we have a marvelous heritage. Mm -hmm. It isn't just sunbonnets, you know. It's all of tap and jazz and all the marvelous Negro uh, black forms and the ethnic forms and all our theater forms and I thought it was time somebody did that, something mm -hmm. about it and I've always loved them. Are we as Americans less interested in our heritage or less interested in dance? We're very interested in dance mm -hmm. but like all colonials we don't think we can do it well enough. Oh and we're and still colonials? I think so mm -hmm. very deeply mm -hmm. but uh, the rest of the world disagrees because our dances and our popular songs are what all the rest of the world is singing and dancing. Mm -hmm. I was in Vienna in October, and on every single taxi cab, there was rock music with American voices singing. Mm -hmm. You didn't say, you, uh, when you were a child, I am told, you wanted to act. Oh, sure, I wanted to be dance. a moving picture star. 
Why a moving picture star? Because all my family were in movies. Of course. Your father was a, a writer in the movies, was he not? A playwright? Uh, and a William director. DeMille? And a director. And Cecil, of course, was a director-producer. And he was your uncle. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and naturally, and I, had, I could always cry at will and scream at will, and that's acting. So, you see, I didn't see why they wasted me. Mm -hmm. But your father wanted you to be a writer. Yes, he did. He wanted me, to, first of all, to be a tennis player. Why a tennis player? Because he was one. I see. And uh, I was trained by world champions. And I was pretty good. I had pretty good style. The only thing was I didn't care whether I won or lost. And of course, that does make a difference. Mm -hmm. You say about your father in uh, one of your autobiographies that he wanted you both, both of you girls, to be boys. I think he did. He never, mm -hmm. I never knew that until after, after he was dead. Mm -hmm. I found letters from him to my mother, and for the first nine years of his life, he referred to us as my boys, my mm. sons. And I suppose the tennis was somehow associated with that as well. I imagine. Mm. And also, he was opposed to actors and actresses. He wouldn't let them in the house. He didn't mind playwrights or directors. Oh. The only three actors that ever entered our home by invitation were Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, and Douglas Fairbanks. Do you know why the exceptions were made in this case? He thought they were no good bums, and I think that's extremely arrogant of him. Yes. Because the people I've met, oh, he liked Walter Hampton, who was also, of course, mm -hmm. a producer, mm -hmm. but um, he wouldn't have them around. Mm -hmm. Why did he make a, uh, the exception with Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks? Pure so? genius. He had to recognize that. I see. <laughs> Even if it was in the wrong field. <laughs> well, uh, he did doff his hat I to see. Chaplin long before people realized. He said, uh. this is one of the greatest talents we've got in the world. Mm -hmm. It's said that you uh, did take up an interest in dance, having seen Pavlova dance at the age of eight. Is this so? Well, I did take it up. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed mm -hmm. I did. What was it about Pavlova that made you want to become a dancer? I don't know. I started crying and couldn't stop. Hmm. That I wasn't part of the dance. acting then. Uh, no, oh. I had to dance. Mm -hmm. And then he opposed that very, very strongly. Mm -hmm. He thought it was a form of circus acrobat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember even when I was in college, I gave it up. I, I was allowed to take dancing lessons, ballet lessons, because my sister's arches fell, thank God. And she was taken to an orthopedist mm -hmm. to have them lifted. And I went along, and he suggested ballet classes. Well, what one sister did, the other one did too. And you see, with me, it was just um, dedication. Mm -hmm. It was like taking the veil or something, I went at it. And Miss Loy spoke mm -hmm. in one mm -hmm. of the sessions with you about Valentino's wife. I think she meant Rambova. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my teacher. I see. And of course, I was terribly in love with both my ballet teachers, mm -hmm. naturally. And uh, and by that time, thoroughly dedicated, I suppose, to thoroughly. Dance. But mm -hmm. I was forbidden to do more than a certain amount of practicing every day, and I disobeyed my parents. And then he got Kozlov, my teacher, to forbid me. Mm. And I had to do two hours at the piano and an hour of tennis, and then I was allowed to practice dancing. Mm. I don't know how I stood it. Now, when did you first, uh, having been trained in dance, begin to dance? Well, I gave it up for college, you see. Where, did, where was that? UCLA, mm -hmm. and took English. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to write That was then. for your father's sake. Yes, it really mm -hmm. was. But mm -hmm. then I got very interested in it. Mm -hmm. I met some extraordinary people there, some great, great teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, then when I was graduated, um, and I laid my diploma at his feet. I said, now I'm going to dance. Mm -hmm. Well, by that time, the family was breaking up, and he was too distraught with his own heartbreak and various things. He, mm -hmm. Mother and he separated, and, and it was a mess. And so mm -hmm. I got on to dancing. But I was, I was a little old for it by that time. How old was that? 19. And that's too old for dance? Old for ballet, yes. I see. Mm -hmm. So you never really felt that you had a fair chance at, at no, being a dancer? No, but you see, you were, I'm, I'm always angry. I'm always mad, and I always feel I haven't got a fair chance, and everything's against me. And it turns out I'm always in the luckiest position possible, because marvelous things happen where I am. Not because of where I am, mm -hmm. but I happen to be there. And I think possibly if I'd been a good classic dancer, I'd have been stuck in a company, and I never would have had to learn to choreograph, mm -hmm. which I did have to learn to do. I was struck with one sentence in, in, in your book, in this same connection, where you say this is the story of someone who got not what she wanted, but better than she deserved. Is that part of what you were just saying? Yes, mm -hmm. I think so. Mm. I'm, I'm a chronic complainer. I'm a real whiner. Why? I don't know. It's my nature. Uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. surly. <laughs> <laughs> You've also admitted in the book that you, uh, when you were young, that you were a very moody girl, sullen, 
and mean and sullen in the parlor and mean at school. I Is that really so? Oh, yes. Mm. But I had flashes of things. I had good friends, mm. and occasionally I did things that were fun, and people recognized that, too. Mm -hmm. Was fun important to you? As it is to everybody, I suppose. Well, fun for me was odd. Fun was making up dances or making up plays mm -hmm. or practicing four hours Bach. That was fun. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's unnatural in a way. I never played as a child. And yet you said you had a happy childhood. I did. Mm. And I, people say to me, now, what do you do for recreation? Well, I, I write books. And that sounds awfully arrogant. It's perfectly true. Mm. I don't play any games. And that distresses my husband because he likes to play mm -hmm. games. I live in such a competitive world all the time that I don't have to invent competition. Mm -hmm. It's built into my life. Do you feel there's only half enough time to do what you want to do? There isn't enough time. Yeah. But I don't waste it playing games. Mm. I have just, as, just too much fun doing other things. Mm. When, did you, when, you, when did you first go to London? Well, we went as school children, first with my mm -hmm. mother. Mm -hmm. And then we came back, and I went. Um, this new book is about when I went in 1933 yes. on my own to make my own way away from my mother and absolutely on but my own. But the book is, is a series of letters to your mother, so you kept in very close touch with oh, your mother. Oh, well, yes. She was alone and she loved me and she was the one that behind my career and uh, mm -hmm. behind me. And I wrote to her long letters mm -hmm. every week. And you said in the book, she married me. And as a wedding gift, she gave me my career. She sacrificed financially in order to support you that while you true. were in London. You were not earning your own way in London, couldn't. despite the fact that you were dancing constantly. Well, I couldn't because they wouldn't let me. First mm. of all, the Home Office wouldn't let me take jobs, and then I wasn't successful. Mm. That is, I was artistically successful to a degree, but I couldn't get a job. My first job was with Cochrane, Charles Cochrane, mm -hmm. in the Gertie Lawrence show. Tell me about Gertrude Lawrence. She was acting in this show, she which, you, star, which you, were, Theron, the where you were directing Porter, the dancing. Porter, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, she was just magic, mm. absolute magic, but very difficult to work with because she never did the uh, same thing mm. twice. What was the magic? Well, you know magic when you see magic. You're I bewitched. See. I see. She, um, she was absolutely iridescent on mm. stage. Mm. I don't know anybody who had her quality. She couldn't sing at all well, and she acted in a rather strange, heightened way. It wasn't realistic acting. It was fantasy acting. Mm. But it was bewitching. And while she was on stage, she couldn't dance. It didn't matter. And funny, oh my. And also, she could touch your heart very deeply. Mm -hmm. And she was chic and lovely and beautiful, and she was very stylish. She set the style for clothes of mm. her time. You met a great many famous people in those years in London. You've met a great many since, but I think of those particular years, and Noel Coward was associated with this same performance, was he not? No, he just a great that. friend. He was a great a friend, friend of Gertie's. And it was Cole, Cole, as you said, it was Cole Porter's music, yes. so obviously you, you, you worked him. with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but the one then I, I met Ger uh, Bernard Shaw. That's the one I wanted to ask you about, because you described him as the sexiest man you ever met. Oh, Summer. he was tremendous. One doesn't think of George Bernard Shaw as a sex symbol. Well, because you've read his letters, and mm. you've read too much about him. But when he bounded into the room, and there was absolutely, he was 70 odd, there's no other word. Mm. And his beard all crisp and white, and he was pan. It Pam. Was pan. Mm. Pan, I see. P-A-N. Mm. And you had lunch with him? Yes, mm -hmm. in his flat in, in London. And uh, the conversation was just incredible. He never spoke until the conversation was ripe for the absolutely killing conclusion or sentence. His wife worked it up, and the guests helped. Mm -hmm. And then when he felt he was ready to say the thing, he gave the coup de grace, and it was memorable and carved in stone and dead also. <laughs> <laughs> then you started another subject. Yeah. Almost as though it were staged. Almost. Mm. She was the most marvelous second man I have ever heard mm. work. Mm. And she'd always speak to him as GBS, what GBS said. Mm. Did, uh, did you meet John Dewey, as I recall? His, uh, oh, he was a great friend of my mother's because oh. he was a devoted, devoted follower of my grandfather, Henry George. Mm -hmm. You know, he said, not since Plato have there been seven greater philosophic thinkers. Mm -hmm. And the followers of your grandfather, the single taxers you've described as your chaperones. Well, Mother knew that they'd keep a terribly watchful eye on me. 
and I had to escape their surveillance mm. if I wanted any kind of young life. And mm. I managed to, but it took a good deal of plotting. Despite your association with them and your support of them, you found some of them rather dull people, I gather. Well, single taxers does sound as though they might be rather preoccupied with well, they're economics. Fanatics. They're yes. fanatics, yes. absolutely mm. besotted. But there were some great ones like Lord Wedgwood and mm. uh, some extraordinary ones. And Bernard Shaw was one for a time, you know. Mm. But the ones that I knew, dull in the sense, they were very fine thinkers, mm. but they were one-track people. Mm. and uh, really absolutely hooded on this, and that's mm. always a little bit wearing. The Danish single taxes were much more fun, very much more fun. What about your grandfather, Henry George? How well did you know him? Oh, he died long before I was born. That's what I was afraid yes. of. Yes, you know, he ran for the mayoralty of New York and dropped dead on the eve of election. It mm. was very dramatic mm -hmm. and uh, tragic. Tammany later conceded that in a previous election he had been elected, mm -hmm. but they stuffed all the ballot boxes and changed it. And he was materially influential in getting what we call the Australian ballot, or the, the ballot we now use. I see. Which came from Australia. But I gather his determination was passed on to your mother and then passed on to you. To a certain degree. Yes. It's still going. Hmm. You know, there's a school, and uh, we have all sorts of things. It's. Hmm. There's an underground movement. I think we better have some sense economically, don't you? Yes, indeed. You left London at the invitation of your uncle, who up, up to that point had not provided any particular help to you in your None. career. None. None. And he invited you to come to Hollywood. Yes. And this was, I guess, the first real big job, in a sense, that you had. What happened? Well, in Hollywood, it was. In Hollywood. Well, uh, doing a Cochrane, big Cochrane show is a good big job. Uh -huh. I mean, for Europe and London, it was big. And uh, I've made a success. I just, I, I just wondered, in terms of payment, did it... Did, oh, did he it didn't pay me anything much. He paid me $250 a week. Mm -hmm. It was a whole lot more than I'd been getting. That's what I meant. It was a, yes, a bigger-paying job. In and terms still not of running. Hollywood, that is paltry. Yes. And, uh, and my fare one way. One way? One way. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the wit to say I must have it returned. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, it was to dance bare, uh, naked on the, on the bare back of a bull. Well, I feel very uneasy with cows. <laughs> and I, um, however, That after sounds like almost the stereotype of Hollywood, an almost unbelievable kind of thing. But, but Cecil was like that. Hmm. Cecil was stereotyped, but he invented stereotype. Hmm. And he believed it so completely and with such flamboyance that his pictures still stand as absolute top examples of their kind. Hmm. And there are always marvelous things in them. What I think he failed to do, mind you, I haven't been asked, but <laughs> given me the opportunity to say, is photograph men and women. I don't think he'd ever met any. Any men and women, real no, people? No, mm -hmm. I don't think so. He saw them in terms of historic symbols. Mm. And when he did, let's say, the Exodus, I think it's moving to the point of tears. But the home scenes of Moses and his mother, I think, are not, not so convincing. You describe him so succinctly in your book. He kept sex, sat sadism, patriotism, real estate, religious and public relations dancing in midair like jugglers' balls for 50 years. Well, That's he did. quite a combination. Well, he did. Mm. And he died rich, and he died successful, and he died very famous, and he's one of the few Hollywood figures that stayed at the top right through. Mm. And when he died, he had six pages of the Los Angeles Times dedicated to him. Mm. It's, um, you know, that's very unusual. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, uh, the end of this particular story, if you're going to dance naked on the back of a bull, was not a particularly happy no, association. No, he said I had no sex. Mm. The bull didn't seem to, well, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> um, there was a matter of, it wasn't a matter I could discuss naked under the searchlights in front yes. of the entire company. Mm -hmm. If he thought I had no sex, I had no sex as far as he was concerned, but it hurt my feelings. I should think it would. So you returned to Europe then? I returned to Europe. Mm -hmm. When did you move from dancing into f completely into choreography? Well, you, you had decided then that you weren't going to be a dancer. At some point you had decided, did you? No, I, I was told. I see. And, and that was after I came back from Europe and was employed by Ballet Theatre, which is now known as the American Ballet Theatre, and mm -hmm. I think it's the finest company in America, to do some choreography. And I said, fine, I will. Um, and I'll do this for myself. And the gentleman who was hiring me said, you will not dance in it. 
You have to do something you won't dance in. And I said, I, I won't do it. And he said, listen to me. I've seen Joaquin make this mistake. I've seen Modkin make this mistake. Mm. You will stretch your talents and you will become a much bigger artist if you will work for somebody else. You're always working for your own body and your own personality mm. and it's limiting you. And he never spoke a truer word, nor did I ever listen to one. I mm. didn't want to, that's again what I say, I didn't yes. want to. I fought that, but I had to get outside of myself and see what a really well-trained body could do and what somebody who didn't have my particular knacks, I'm a good comedian, for instance. Mm. I had to work with somebody who wasn't such a good comedian and put it into the gesture. Mm. And it did stretch me out. Yes. How, how, how do you bring this about in working with others and get them to, to Oh, that's perform. a long process. I think slow process? Long I and slow mm -hmm. and tedious. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to think it through my own body first, you know, and mm -hmm. do things. And then I get a chosen few who know me pretty well, and I know them. And we lock ourselves away secretly, and I just try things out hour by hour mm -hmm. until I get a piece of movement that, that looks quite wonderful and effective and rhythmic and, you know, with a beat in it. Does it have to feel good as well? Yes, always uh, does. Yes. And uh, then I said, that's that. And then when I get enough of them, then I have building blocks, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I have, my, I have my vocabulary for the new dance. And then I put it on, on the dancers who are going to do it, and then I redo it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and redo it, and redo it. Jerry Robinson. Does that mean it's never finished? Oh yes, it's sometimes yeah. finished. Okay. I'm never quite satisfied, but sometimes I just leave things alone that I'm not satisfied with because I just have got to stop fussing mm -hmm. and tampering. Jerry Robbins said to me, you know, I, I work the first three days on something and I go in prepared and it no, doesn't matter if I prepare six months, the first three days are just garbage and have to be thrown out. And he mm -hmm. said, why can't you do the first three <laughs> days before you go into <laughs> rehearsal? But it's just a stage you have to go through. Well, you mm -hmm. see the big, good things come instinctively. They come mm. almost by accident. Mm. But you can't count on this, and you never get them if you haven't done the slugging work before. Yeah. Was Rodeo the first big success in this respect? Yes, it was. And it was, it was re a real, true success. And it was done with the Ballet Russe. Your Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo mm. during the war, and we got 22 curtain calls at the Metropolitan Opera House the opening night. Mm. And with European dancers, was there any no, difficulty? Oh, no, they, no weren't. they weren't. So many, there were a great many American and Canadians, oh. though they had Russian names. Mm -hmm. And the reason, <laughs> I, the reason I was permitted to do it was because we were in war, and they suddenly decided it would be a very good patriotic and timely thing. Uh, popular, you see. Mm -hmm. If they did an American ballet on an American subject by an American, this was the bizarre mm -hmm. aspect, because generally it had been done by a Russian. And so they came to me and said, did I have an idea? And I didn't, but I said, of course I do. And then I thought hard for two days and came up with this and got Aaron Copeland, demanded mm. Aaron Copeland, and we got to work. And it's about writing and so forth. A lot of the work I'd prepared in London before, and uh, I showed it to the people. It was, it's very difficult to do, very difficult. And the Russians said, this is not dancing. And I said, I didn't say it was, but this is what you're going to have to do. And they just left the room all block. So that left the Americans and Canadians. And they could, you could teach them about They were willing to be taught. Mm -hmm. And those men never moved like that. I tell you, when they hit the stage that night, there was a roar from the house. There really was. It it's, was. I'm not exaggerating. Mm -hmm. And the cast itself, I suspect, was very excited about this kind oh, of tremendous. thing. tremendous. And the men in the pit playing the score for the first time. You know, mm -hmm. it's a very fine score. Mm -hmm. It's become American tradition. Yes, of course. Well, they're standing up, you know, beating with their bows on the strings. You don't get the Union boys to do that. <laughs> It was, it was an extraordinary night. Mm -hmm. What about the night that Oklahoma opened? Well, you know it wasn't so much of a success. It wasn't? No, we couldn't fill the house. Not nearly. I'd, mm. I knew it was going to be something of a success because of the Boston, um, the Boston success. Mm -hmm. And so I'd bought ten tickets, I think it was, or maybe it was eight, in the front row of the balcony. You could afford them then. It was two fifty each, or mm -hmm. maybe these tickets were two dollars. Mm. And I was getting fifty dollars a week at that point. But I could, I did, because it was a splurge, it was a gala, mm -hmm. and then I couldn't find people to put in them. Mm -hmm. I went out onto 44th Street and dragged in some dancers that were loitering and said, you want to see an opening? And they weren't averse, so they came in and sat down. And um, the press wasn't all that much the first night. Why? 
I don't know so, why Brigadoon's mm. Press was better, mm. but this rolled up. My goodness me, what mm. happened? Yes. Two days later, three days later, the queue was around the block. Mm. And I went off to get engaged to a soldier and um, came back and was being interviewed by um, somebody from the New York Times. And he said something, and this man said, I don't think, Mr. Mill, you realize what kind of a success this is that you've participated mm. in. And I said, well, never having had a real one, I said, what kind? He said, probably the biggest in the 20th century. And I mm. said, well, for goodness sakes. You know, my salary didn't change. Nothing changed for me. You've not made a great deal of money out of this. Not out of Oklahoma, I haven't. Mm -hmm. Very, very little. Mm. But uh, the contract stuck. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it, it was, I was first signed to do for $1,500, no royalties. All rights mm -hmm. given up, all. And then Dick Rogers heard about this, and he thought that was not quite fair, so he arranged for me to get $50 a week. And then after the Times man said this, I went to the Theatre Guild and said to Lawrence Langdon, I'm married, going to marry a soldier on, on pay, you know, private, mm -hmm. no grade, and he has no money, and I have no money, and I have 10 years of debts. Do you think you could make it 75 a week? <laughs> and he said, no, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't. So that was that. But then I did have, of course, chances to work other places. What, what, what has been important to you, Mr. Mill? You came from a famous family, so it can't be entirely fame, which you now enjoy. Money, which you've not always been able to, to well, get. Well, I did get some, you know, yeah, I, so but the government took most what of it. What has been important? Just the, the chance to do what you've wanted to do? That. And do you know that's the most precious thing in the world? I don't think I've ever in my life had to work at something I despised. And now you ask how many people that's true. I suspect very few. I mean, I see so many businessmen and, and people in the business end mm -hmm. of the theaters. I love what I'm doing. And when I went down south to do this heritage company with these children in a gymnasium and young kids, I, I worked for nothing. So did they, poor mm -hmm. things, but they were students. Mm -hmm. To see the ideas flower on their faces and in their bodies, and I'd say, stop, do it this way and on this count, and there'd be a yell from the kids because they got the idea. Mm. Well, now look, this is just heaven. This is, this is very great. Thank you very much, Mr. Mill.